Do you want to find out what the experts in distilled spirits businesses have to say about managing and operating a distillery? Well, you should probably check out the Distilled Spirits Business Certificate from the University of Louisville. It's a six-course online program taught in part by real corporate fellows, meaning that you're getting real experience from real experts at the most renowned distilleries, companies, and startups in the distilling industry. We're talking leaders from Brown Foreman, Jack Daniels, and more. So get enrolled into this fully online program at uofl.me slash bourbon pursuit. There's a new award-winning four-grain bourbon that's been taking the market by storm. It's Penelope Bourbon. Bottled at the historic Castle and Key Distillery, Penelope's balanced yet flavorful taste profile comes from a unique blend of three bourbon mash bills. It's currently available in two expressions, 80 proof and cash strength. It fits your mood whether you're sipping neat or in a cocktail. Penelope is available in select markets as well as online at PenelopeBourbon.com. You know, after our Meltdown Ice Press video went viral on TikTok and Instagram, every person that comes over to my house, they want to see it in action. So I put on a block of ice, put the top on it, and you watch the melted water drip down the groove channels and you end up with a perfect sphere. Stunning is easily the best word to describe it. Go get one of your own at MeltdownIce.com. In order to take those leaps of faith, you have to have that just inherent every night, every morning optimism of somehow, no matter what happens, whatever fires you're going to put out today, it's going to work out. Yeah. I thought I was like a crazy idea, man. Then I met Macaulay and I was like, <laughs> man, he has got ideas for days. Welcome back, everybody. It's episode 287 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman. And before we start today's podcast, talking about how to build a big source brand, here's your weekly bourbon news update. The U.S. is continuing to slap new tariffs on spirits in retaliation for a deal that's completely unrelated to alcohol. Certain cognacs, grape brandies, and wine from France and Germany will now see a 25% duty rate increase starting on January 12th. This is in response to the European Union's 25% tariff that was introduced back in November 2020 on rum, vodka, brandy, and vermouth from the U.S. And that increase actually came immediately after another 25% tariff on single malt scotch and single malt Irish whiskey and liqueurs from the European Union. And that was kicked off around October of 2019. Now, these tariffs have a real effect. Scotch exports declined year to year by 34% between October of 2019 and when the U.S. introduced that 25% tariff. So, why are we doing this? This all dates back to 2004 and is, has nothing to do at all with alcohol. It's part of a tit-for-tat dispute approved by the World Trade Organization that began as a part of a penalty against the European Union for subsidies of the aircraft company Airbus. And apparently actions by Airbus this past summer will hopefully have ended this dispute, but this impacts us even in bourbon. So we need this resolved. So pay attention and look to hear more news about this in the future. Now moving on to bourbon release news. Country music singer Lee Greenwood is preparing to launch a whiskey this spring in partnership with Omaha, Nebraska's Soldier Valley Spirits. Greenwood's signature bourbon is going to be featuring the same liquid as Soldier Valley's 6 bourbon, which will be phased out as this new release steps in. The 45% ABV 6-year-old whiskey blends Soldier Valley's house-made bourbon distilled from Nebraska corn with source bourbon and it's packaged in a bottle resembling a World War II era canteen with red, white, and blue dog tags around the neck. It's gonna be priced at $55, and the bourbon will initially roll out in the Gulf Coast and military bases across the US. Now in today's podcast, we talk about building a brand on source product, because let's face it, if you're not the one distilling the product, it's hard to be price competitive. We know we've been trying to do this forever, and today we're joined by Macaulay Williams of Big River Distilling, who's behind brands like Blue Note Bourbon and Riverset Rye. He also helped us launch everything that we do as a part of Pursuit Spirits. We talk about how to integrate and how to run a large scale business that relies primarily on sourcing and how you protect the brand's flavor integrity going forward. Joe from Barrel Bourbon wants you to know that it's gotten a whole lot easier to get their unique cash strength whiskeys from around the world delivered right to your door. Just visit BarrelBourbon.com and click the Buy Now button. Enjoy today's episode now here's Fred Minnick with the Buff the Char. 
I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Cindy, who writes me on fredminnick.com. She writes, What do you do with your empty bourbon bottles that are nice for a recycling bin, yet pointless to store? That is a great question, Cindy. And I will tell you what, I actually used to have someone who would go through my uh, recycling bin and pull out the bottles. Um, There was a guy in our neighborhood who was digging through trash for a while, and I found that kind of creepy. So I found I found a friend who is uh, who makes like uh, soap dispensers and lamps and things like that. And I just give him my bottles. Now, that's what I give him my like everyday bottles. I don't give him my um, super rare ones like Kentucky Owl or Michter's 10-year-old, or Pappy Van Winkle, I actually destroy those just to prevent any any potential resell of the empty bottles that can lead to unwanted counterfeit. Well, no counterfeit is wanted. So that's just a little thing that I do. But to be honest with you, you know, we, in the month of December of 2020, you know, my wife and I, who were very much in, we were on the joy mode for the Christmas holidays and everything, I think we went through 14 bourbon bottles. Now, granted, a lot of those were on their way out, and so we kind of drained like the last two or three drinks out of them. But it's always joyful for me to to complete a a bourbon bottles journey, and I'm glad that they end up in a, a soap dispenser somewhere. And um, yeah, so that's what I do with them. I, I turn them over to a friend um, who turns them into soap dispensers. But great question. And if you are looking for something to do with your empty bottles, yeah, you might be able to, you know, turn it into a hobby like soap dispensing or making lamps. Lord knows we need more bourbon bottle lamps. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you're like Cindy and having an idea for Above the Char, hit me up on fredminnick.com. Just shoot me an email and we'll see if it makes the airways. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to the episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Ryan taking a trip down to Beale Street into Memphis. Uh, we're uh, we're talking. Actually, we come here a lot. There's a reason we come here a lot, and this is because yeah. the people that we're going to be talking to today, or the gentleman we're talking to, is very instrumental in the founding of Pursuit Spirits as well. Yeah, we come down what two, three times a year, and gosh, I hate the drive, but every time I get here, I'm like, oh, it's worth it. You it's know? it's you, for the you ribs. Go hit up Cozies and get to see our good friend. You know, our guest we'll introduce here soon, but. Yeah, we love it here. I mean, without this place and our guest, we would just be podcasters and maybe doing true. some, you know, some single barrels with big distilleries and not doing our own thing. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited to yeah, that's share what... uh, our guest story and kind of talk about how he got us started and how what he's doing because uh, he's been instrumental to us. And uh, it's it's a fascinating side of the business that many people don't know. And yeah. so... Uh, It'll be cool. Yeah, no, I totally agree because this is, as anybody does does not know, is like, this was the email that I received and said, would you want to start your own bourbon brand? And I was like, never really thought about it. So this is the guy that actually made it happen. So today on the show, we have Macaulay Williams. Macaulay is the CEO and founder and co-founder of BR Distilling Company located in Memphis, Tennessee. So Macaulay, how are you doing today? Doing great, guys. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. So before we kind of dive into, you know, what you've been doing and and really the premise of the show today is to talk about, you know, building a brand off of like pure sourcing, like how you start it from the bottom up and how you do it in large scale. But before we get too far, we always start this new season kind of talking about a a random icebreaker. So here's yours for the day. So what game show would you want to be a contestant on? Family Feud. Oh, Oh, that's a good one. My it, wife loves Family Feud. Yeah. Are you uh, like the new ones with Steve Harvey or would you go back like old school to a different host? You know, I like them all. Steve Harvey cracks me up. That's why I want to go on the show. <laughs> I just think yeah. it'd be so funny. And he always has like the same reaction every single time when somebody says something like very lewd, like, you know, he just he looks at the camera like, Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not for the prize it'd be for the entertainment value yeah. on the show right yeah, yeah that's a good one that is a good one. what about you ryan what what contestant would you want to be on oh gosh uh i mean gosh family few would be awesome um legends of the hidden temple or oh. something I lo- <laughs> when i was a kid i yeah, loved that like back. yeah i'd like to run through the pyramids and punch the whatever go through the guy that's talking face or i don't know whatever oh, oh, oh something was it oh, odin oh yeah i don't, I don't know. know it that, was something like but that, that seemed like a cool show that was awesome or yeah. that like ultimate challenge you know like that you know was over in asia or something it's like don't get eliminated oh, you know, oh that one like, 
Yeah. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, Spike I, TV. I know exactly what you're talking about. Man, you think you can just bring back all the Nickelodeon shows. I mean, I love, Double watching, Dare, Double I love Dare. watching Jeopardy, but there's no way I could be a contestant. <laughs> right, that's I, I would, too much pressure. Yeah, I'd be like, get, I'd be negative $5,000 when qualify for Final Jeopardy. Well, it's the same thing of me saying, like, I want to go in like an American Ninja Warrior. Like, right. It sounds cool, but there's no way it's going to happen. Yeah. No, nah, I mean, I think for me, it's, and it's the quintessential of all game shows and it's the price is right. But if, uh, I, have, yeah. if I have to choose the game on the price is right, I mean, what's the most iconic game? Plinko. Plinko, exactly. Yeah. It's either that one or like the Yodeler going up the. <laughs> I, I do like the Yodeler one. That was good. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure this is where we wanted to talk about today. <laughs> hey, every, everybody's got their favorite game show. And, you know, if you really think about it, there's a lot that you want to be a contestant on, whether it's big money or big prizes or just uh, for the glory yeah actually you know what the probably the easiest one could probably could ever be is like deal or no deal yeah there's like would... there's like no skill in it whatsoever yeah and that you're, you're just like uh should i open it or not <laughs> <laughs> you know it's like pure luck and it'll be like oh it's my daughter's birthday 23 i'll take 23 you're like it's the dollar oh damn it yeah, yeah screwed <laughs> up should just kept the money <laughs> All right, let's go ahead. We'll switch gears and get back to uh, talking about stop talking about game shows for a minute. So, you know, Macaulay, we want to bring you on, and, and kind of we'll start back uh, in the very beginning. So, let's rewind a few years ago to when we all kind of came into contact, sure. right? Um, you know, what does it take to kind of you know build something from the ground up? Because we had actually talked before, like you you were a lawyer at one point, right? You, yep. You gave it up to go in the. The, the booze business. Yeah, I'm a recovering attorney now on the <laughs> booze business, right? <laughs> yeah, how the um, hell does that happen? <laughs> well, I uh, practice mergers and acquisitions at a large firm here in Memphis, uh, one of the largest firms in the Southeast. And uh, I was trying to pick up new clients of my own. And one of them uh, was a vodka distillery that, that was based in the building we're sitting, into, sitting in today. Um, and unfortunately, their business model wasn't panning out and the company was going under. And so I got to learn a little bit about the craft spirits industry from my client. Ultimately, we liquidated the business and I saw an opportunity with a DSP sitting here with all licensure and most of the necessary functioning equipment to get started. And I'd always wanted to do something entrepreneurial. And over the course of about 12 months representing that client, I just kind of fell in love with the business opportunity of transitioning that vodka distillery to doing whiskey, so bourbon and rye whiskey. And um, I, I got to the point where I was just dreaming about whiskey barrels at night. And so- uh, now, some, now you have no shortage of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah now, now you're smothered in them. Can't so even breathe. Went in on the business with some of my uh, other clients and mentors, and we bought the distillery out of liquidation. And then I quit my job to come on and run the distillery full time. So. Not really what I had in mind when I was thinking about what I was going to do with my life, but this has been a whole lot of fun. And in, in college and law school, you know, I got a whole lot of experience with uh, with drinking bourbon and, and rye whiskey. So, so it's been great. Yeah, we've been at it for three years now. Um, actually, three years this month of the recording. So uh, we're excited to get going, and we've seen a lot of success that we've been very fortunate to have over the last few years. And it's definitely been a journey taking effectively a defunct, empty warehouse that technically had its licensure and transitioning it into a functioning business um, and, and scaling it. And now, you know, we're blessed to have thousands of barrels in this facility today. And, you know, we're really looking towards the next five years of growth from here. So what's that first step? You're like, all right, I want to be in the whiskey business and, but I don't have a still, I don't have this. Like, what is that first step to like start acquiring, you yeah. know, some juice, some product and like, going about that whole process. So the very first step, not, and I won't go into too much detail on it, but just to emphasize for any uh, entrepreneurs or future entrepreneurs out there is you got to, you know, meet with your lawyers and tax advisors because you want to make sure you have the right entity formations and all of the boring kind of back office stuff squared away. But then when it gets to the actual business model itself, you know, like anything you want to do an immense amount of due diligence, which for me um, started off by buying every single book I could find on bourbon and, and like finding every podcast, movie, uh, YouTube video that explains how the industry works, where the trends are, starting to study data, reading in public company filings about what their forward-looking trends on the industry are. So just that basic industry due diligence. And what I learned from all of those books and all the success stories that had come before of really you know, big brands that were started out of nowhere, big companies that started out of nowhere, is that you need to find great uh, distillation partners and actually outsource the distillation, or as some people refer to as sourcing the juice. So meeting somebody who has excess distillation capacity 
and laying down and buying inventory from them to kickstart this thing, right? Because this is a unique business where your inventory has to age many years before it's viable uh, for sale. So that's really the first step is understanding how to acquire the inventory. So the, uh, the next thing about maybe what people don't understand is that this is a, a super capital intensive like business, right? Absolutely. I mean, this, and it's, and it's nothing that it's, it's very much not a, a get rich quick kind of game. Um, you know, anytime you even do buy anything and you got to sit on it, you got to age it. I mean, that's, that's money that could be spent elsewhere. So kind of talk about what it is to go and either like raise funds, raise capital, whatever it is to kind of make something like this happen. Yeah, absolutely. So just kind of taking uh, some steps from what I was saying earlier. So it starts with understanding where you're going to source the inventory from and what exactly you want your product to taste like. And then it takes initial upstart capital, uh, which I was fortunate enough to have some great business partners to provide us with that, call it family uh, and friends type round funding, the initial call it million dollars to get going. And that would be for capital just to for basic operations and basically turning nothing into an operating business but then the the real tricky thing in this industry like you were talking about is the fact that the inventory has to age which means you have to carry many years of inventory on your books so just for example if you're selling a four-year-old product you would need to have approximately four to five years of inventory on your books in order to have a go-forward strategy meaning you'd have to have bottle ready you know four-year-old product three-year-old two-year-old one-year-old and be laying down new fill and so when you're uh, a company like us that's trying to build a national brand or a national portfolio of whiskey brands, you're looking at very large projections and very you know, quickly escalating sales growths and you know, effectively glorified spreadsheets that are your pro forma predicting your growth. And so, you know, if you're planning for the future and it planning big things to come, that new fill number you're laying down is a very daunting number, meaning you're laying down you know, enough barrels to potentially be selling 50, 60,000 nine liter cases five years from now, when maybe you're only selling like 10,000 or 5,000 today, which is, um, you know, really intimidating to invest that amount of capital in future inventory. So we've all probably seen Shark Tank and the sharks will often hammer entrepreneurs for carrying too much inventory on your books. You know, our t-shirt company, why do you have so many t-shirts on your books? Like on, that, demand. on that, demand. Yeah, that could have been towards sales or marketing or whatever. But in this, in this business, you have to make that investment. And there's kind of a, um, a directionally correct statement that's proliferated in the industry that if you want to build a national brand, you need to lay down on day one around $10 million and go forward inventory. And so that would give you your bottle ready and then your three, two, in one year old, if you're going for that four year old product, well, we definitely don't have 10 million laying around. Well, but, but before we get too far, I also want you to give a shout out of the brands that you do have. Yeah, so people absolutely. are, people are, we're getting really into the business side of it, but people right. might not know exactly the brands that you represent. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for that. Yeah. So we're BR Distilling, which stands for Big River Distilling in Memphis. And we have two flagship brands, uh, Blue Note Bourbon and River Set Rye. Under the Blue Note Bourbon brand, we have in front of us today two of our, uh, three SKUs that we offer. So we have our nine-year-old premium small batch, which is the tall skinny bottle in the middle. We have our Blue Note Juke Joint, which is the blue bottle uh, to the left of the screen. And then we also do uh, nine through 11-year-old single barrels. And we are coming out with some fun uh, higher end expressions of some 17, 18-year-old single barrels, as well as some exotic finishes. And then under our River Set brand, we have uh, our four-year-old 93 proof River Set Rye, um, and then we also have a four-year-old uh, cash drink single barrel expression not, not featured on the screen today. Uh, we presently have distribution in 10 states as of the day of this recording. We're trying to grow. Like I said, the goal is to build these into national brands. Uh, we launched the brands in 2018 and are seeing you know, fairly rapid success. So talk about the initial. So, you, you know, you're talking about sourcing to meet the needs now. So like with your investor, did you have a proof of concept or like, did you have to prove a proof of concept? Okay, we're going to take these age barrels. We'll sell them first to show you like what we're, or were you able to convince them initially? Like, hey, we got to start laying New Mac down now or. or Absolutely. They so, you know, in, in, in this industry, as we've been emphasizing the importance of having inventory, it's really understanding the inventory because that's really the difference between the haves and the have nots. If you have the inventory, it's all about the executional risk of whether you can sell said inventory. So one of the things that fascinated us early on was the fact that this inventory, barrels of whiskey, appreciate in value as you age them, meaning you can lay down new fill 
and you can then sell on the bulk market those barrels to generate cash flow a year, two, three years later at a higher price point. So you can buy barrels for about six hundred to seven hundred dollars per barrel and sell them for anywhere from twenty five hundred dollars uh, to fifteen hundred dollars per barrel. You know whether it's four to two years later. And so that initial concept is what I call our vodka. You know, most uh, craft whiskey distilleries start off with a white spirit, a, a vodka or a gin to generate cash flow. Our business model was we started buying barrels of new make whiskey along with what we planned on to be our go forward inventory and sold those to other bottlers, blenders, and distillers to create some initial cash flow in uh, replace of doing a white spirit. We're a whiskey company solely focused on building whiskey brands. So we didn't want to get distracted by selling a white spirit or for our brands to be associated with a vodka or gin early. Um, so that concept is what really allowed us to take the leap of faith into this business of knowing that if we're investing this heavily in the inventory, it's actually appreciating in value. Whereas if you're buying cotton or corn or other agricultural products, you know, it depreciates in value as it ages because it becomes less you know, good, less saleable. So that early concept uh, was how we were able to convince uh, initial investors to take that leap of faith with us. <laughs> you're <laughs> you're going to get your you're money like, back. Uh, no I promise. What. These pro formas are you know, what well, would you say directionally correct? You know? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's our saying is they're directionally correct. Right. And so whiskey does in today's market appreciate, appreciate around 400% in value over the first four years. It's a very opaque market though. So it's not like the, uh, commodity exchanges in Chicago where you can just go on and spot check the price of right. cotton, corn, soybean, whatever else you're trading. So it's interesting. So it's not necessarily the most viable business opportunity to really get in as a quote trader or invest you know, like New York yeah, money into it. You have to have, have, to have relationships. Know. And there is a finite amount of bulk inventory you can sell. But that, that initial concept was really the bedrock of our business of knowing that our money was going into something that was stable, would appreciate in value. And we won't go too far into it, but the other big thing is the insurance side of the business, oh, of God. insuring God, the inventory. Yeah. You know, it's obviously flammable. <laughs> I got a quote for our meager barrel count, and it's like, holy shit, I'm just, gonna just <laughs> let it roll. It's daunting <laughs> we'll, to we'll say the, the least. Risk. Yeah, we'll take the risk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's daunting to say the least. I mean, you have fire, natural disaster exposure, and then all of the recent uh, catastrophes in Kentucky with collapsed rick houses and fires uh, have really diminished uh, underwriters' appetite to you know, cover whiskey barrels. And then also, unfortunately, a lot of the underwriters lump in wine, the wine industry, where the wine and spirits industry. So a lot of the big losses out in California due to those big yeah, fires, droughts, years, fires. Dr droughts and fires, and then just all the natural disasters and pandemics going on have really uh, made insuring your barrels a much more daunting task than it used to be. Ugh. Wow. Yeah. That's not the pretty side of the business. Not no. the pretty side. No. So, so okay. You're like, all right, I got some money. I got some investors, you know, and, you know, three years ago, I guess, you know, there's a lot of new contract distillation companies coming out, but they're not established. How do you go about, you know, saying, hey, this is the the stuff I want, something I think I can build, but it's going to be three to four years from now. Yeah. And like, talk about, you know, that process in your mind. Like, and Absolutely. So, you know, the first key point is that our goal is to build these international brands and then one day uh, do some or all of our own distillation. Our goal, though, is to build uh, an industrial size business here in Memphis. So an industrial size bottling plant with industrial size distillation in the future. So there is an element when thinking that far down the road that could be 10 years down the road, um, how you're going to maintain quality control. And you kind of have to back in that thought process to get to your point, Ryan, about how you select your distillation partner because you want to uh, have a proprietary taste associated with your product, right? It needs to be unique and you want to be able to maintain that quality control and be thinking too, if you were to shift over at some point to your own distillation, how you could get as close to replicating that product to make the blending better for, you know, the future quality control. So there, yeah, there have been a lot of new uh, bulk distillation or industrial distillation facilities come online in uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, and elsewhere. Um, and so that's why I think the first step in getting into it is that due diligence and building a trusted team, not, not just the team of investors and employees and personnel at your company, but trusted folks, trusted advisors or mentors, if you will, in the industry that can point you in the right direction and get you in the door with uh, the who's who of the industry. And ultimately it's relying on meeting said uh, bulk distiller 
and vetting their pedigree based on their reputation within the industry and their experience. And then, you know, actually tasting and working with them to make sure their product is what, what you want your product to be like. But it's all, it, there is sort of that leap of faith. Uh, again, there's many leaps of faith on this journey. Uh, but in trusting that the the new make that you're tasting today is going to turn into and develop into what you need it to, <laughs> what be, you want it to be in the future, right? Crossed, yeah. And that's where, obviously where the art of the blend comes in on the back end where you can uh, help take it in various directions, which we all, we all know blending can very much become the art form of this, you know, as you guys are figuring out with your, with your new uh, experiments. But yeah, it's, it's our, it's just really reputation pedigree and meeting, meeting them and then if they have representative samples in the future. I think that's what's made MGP so popular for a lot of folks. So we don't, um, none, none of our brands presently have Indiana product in it. It's, it's Kentucky and Tennessee only right now. Uh, but the folks at MGP are great. And I think that's why a lot of folks go over there is because you can taste their older mm -hmm. spirit, right? So you have a much better idea of what it's going to develop into. Now, the other thing that you kind of mentioned and that, you know, we've talked about before is that, you know, the source market, everything like that, it's, it's a, you know, it's a kind of backdoor yeah. kind of like handshake agreement. Like you got to know people. It's not like something that's going to be disrupted by technology tomorrow. And you can go to a, like open up your Schwab account and, you know, go buy barrels in the open market. Like you can't do that, but it is a very competitive market, right? Yeah. I mean, we've, we've noticed this firsthand of like saying, you know, when we're trying to create our blends and, you know, we there's some six-year-old product in the market like okay cool can we get a sample let's try it we tried it oh sweet let's go buy a few barrels you call them up and they're like oh sorry it's all sold yeah within a day and so yeah it's it's crazy so kind of talk about like the competitiveness of what it is for you all to be able to source the product that that you need to keep a consistent you know, yeah. consistency for the yeah portfolio. you can buy that first batch and you're like oh it's great but then you're like yep. oh, crap i gotta get more mm -hmm. <laughs> in this for this age range well there's two kind of three different components to it so one we've been talking about right presently has been the contract distillation when we're talking about meeting the right producer so that is laying down the you know call it four to five years in the future's inventory uh, and that's where you have a little more quality control in-house of talking about mash bill fermentation temperatures the oak uh, where it's stored, et cetera. But the other point that y'all are getting at now is then how do you get the go forward inventory to build the brand, to meet the demand for those thousands of barrels you just laid down. And so that's where you get into, um, the bulk market a little bit, and it is very competitive. So hopefully your contract distilling partner, you know, either has a, uh, replicable inventory of the mash bill and product you're making or something similar that you can blend to make it taste like your product will taste. Um, that's obviously the ideal situation, but what you often find is uh, shortfalls in in that availability of inventory. So you're having to buy things on the spot market, and in our products, you know, it's all about consistency. Um, so looking for and finding the right barrels on the market that are going to make our product taste the way it always has tasted during those instrumental growth years that we're in right now is what y'all are getting at, which is really tricky, and it is very competitive as more as as the overall demand for American whiskey is going up. Uh, more people are getting into the business. More people are starting brands. Uh, more brands are releasing new SKUs. Um, and so there's ultimately more buyers in the market, which drives price up. And it's an interesting it's an interesting business in that buying on the bulk market, it's a cash upfront as is, where is purchase. It's the I mean, worst. <laughs> it's the, the worst. There's, there's no guarantee whatsoever. Well, meaning in most other you know, industries, there would be some form of, and, th and there are some people that do deposits, but for the most part, it's not, you put down 20% and then pay it off over some period of time. If you want to buy X number of barrels, say you have a hundred barrels that you need to, to get in to blend to meet your present demand, you need to wire the money for all hundred of those barrels. There's and no uh, net 30 or net 60. <laughs> there's not net, there's typically it's uh, cause they won't transfer it into your ownership until you've paid the full balance of yeah. the barrels. Right. And then you're, there's some risk too, in that it's an as is, where is purchase, meaning the buyer always assumes uh, evaporation or leakage loss. So in those, let's say you bought a hundred barrels, you could have some kind of dud barrels in there. Typically the industry standard is if it's completely bone dry empty, the uh, seller will replace it. But if it's supposed to have 40 gallons based on that age in the barrel and it only has 10, the, the buyer has assumed that risk on the purchase. And then the buyer also assumes all risk of transportation, of getting that product from wherever it's physically located to said blending bottling facility. It's, yeah. It's, it's the Tokyo drift of uh, angel share. Like it's just, it's just like evaporating like as on the truck. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about like, uh, you know, the, the cost of being in the source because people all the time are like, 
oh, it's just source whiskey and it's this much money, you know, it's so expensive, like compared to like, you know, yeah. Heaven Hill or Brown Foreman products, you know, and you're like, well, you know, the pricing's a big factor in that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's based on the, the pricing of bulk whiskey. So we're talking about the bulk whiskey trade, right? Where people are buying distillers, bottlers, blenders, brokers, or buying and trading aged barrels of whiskey. So the value of any given barrel is going to be based on first, the state of distillation, and if disclosed to the distiller of who actually pr- the original uh, distillation facility and the reputation that facility has, um, and then next the age of that product, and then actually the kind of more specifics and nuances of mash bill, fermentation, temp, and oak quality really is the final structure. So again, it's state, uh, then the distiller, then the age, and then the the nuances of the exact product, and then uh, you know Indiana. Kentucky, Tennessee are the primary producers of bulk whiskey that's being traded. Uh, Kentucky bourbon typically trades at a premium to Indiana and Tennessee. Indiana's bulk whiskey is going to be often determined by MGP's own internal trading. And if they're in a heavy trading quarter, that can drive the price for other holders of that product down or up if they're not selling, depending on the market availability. It's like Mortimer, like cornering the market on oranges. Right? <laughs> yeah, and, that's right. <laughs> trading places. And then Tennessee, you know, there's been a lot more distillation capacity come online here in Tennessee. So Tennessee pricing is increasing steadily. We're obviously very bullish on Tennessee products in general. We're here in Tennessee and producing and, and, and crafting our own Tennessee bourbons and whiskeys here. Um, And then Kentucky is where it's the most competitive, right? Because there's the most uh, overall production capacity and then it has the most cachet in the industry. Um, But it's going to be based on the age of that product and the overall supply demand in the market is going to determine the price. So once you start getting north of four to five years, whether it be uh, Indiana, Tennessee, or Kentucky, you're going to see the price go up dramatically because... um, there's not a whole lot of availability of inventory there, and it is already appreciated in value. The appreciation and value of American whiskey is on a, it's not really a bell curve, it's more of a plateau-like curve that appreciates around 400% in the first four to five years, and then plateaus and steadily increases thereafter. Meaning in the first four years, you're gonna see the product increase in value by 300 to 400% because uh, of the just the overall supply demands that people are willing to pay you know, a higher price for that aged product due to the intrinsic value creation of the maturation process. Yeah. Well, in that case, I guess we're going to, I'm going to start moving some more money over to barrels then. <laughs> Sounds like a better investment. Well, yeah. And too, like, so, you know, you got a warehouse full of stuff, but you might not even need per se to buy more aged stuff, but sometimes you don't ever know when it's going to come back on. And so you got to be like, you know, willing to buy when it's available because it's not always available when you need it. And that's exactly. another difficult aspect of this business exactly and so that's what like when when you look at your pro forma you're just we're just counting down the days to our new fill comes to the next round of new fill comes online because that's the product that we've laid down we really control our destiny as we say when we lay down product um and then margin obviously increases dramatically when you've laid it down uh on balance sheet as opposed to buying already aged on the spot market but during these turbulent years of growth and trying to build the brand and demand um yeah you're not only looking about how many barrels you presently need so for like our blue note nine year since we we were formed three years ago it's no secret that's obviously a sourced product um and our demand for 2020 is you know x number of barrels or x number of cases that we need to fulfill demand for the rest of the year but with a product that old and rare, uh, we can't just buy the exact number we need for the remainder of 2020 because there might not be any available until a year from now. So we need to buy as much as we possibly can at any given time, you know, until you're effectively just supplementing inventory until your new fill comes online. And those are the the uh, really turbulent years of sourcing product. Um, and it's when you got to do the major selling to your investors, like I promise, man, once this new <laughs> fill back, turns, it's a, it, we'll, we'll get it back for you. I mean, it's a daunting, it's a daunting task, no doubt. And you know, inventory, like I say, again, is the barrier to entry to this business. Some people think that they can just buy four or five barrels and then sell that and then use the proceeds to buy eight barrels or 10 barrels and then use that to buy. Yeah. We're it, trying that. And it's, it's kind of, 
it, it's going well. But it's, not, it's tough. It's yeah, tough though. It's, it's, we, it's hard to scale though. That's because we help you out. <laughs> that's yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> and so I kind of want to kind of dovetail onto what Ryan's question was. And, you know, people, you know, they do complain. They're like, oh, like this brand costs X, but you cost two times more and it's the same product. Like they'll know where the, yeah, exactly. The source. Sure. Is so how are you creating uh, something that, you know, is, is your kind of like main sticking point or selling point for your brands and how you're trying to create that, that differentiator? Attention private pick enthusiasts, whiskey geek retailers, and aspiring bourbon brand owners. Go to krogmans.com today to get started with one of the most unique barrel selections in the business where everything, it's catered to you. Dream up any label or idea that you want and they can make it happen. So if you're tired of settling for awkward stickers on the sides of bottles, Krogman's Barrel Picks lets you have total control over your design from start to finish. With low minimums and quick turnaround times, Krogman's can take your pick to the retailer of your choice, ASAP. Go to krogmans.com. That's K-R-O-G-M-A-N-S.com to get started. How are you creating uh, something that, you know, is, is your kind of like main sticking point or selling point for your brands and how you're trying to create that, that differentiator. Yeah, absolutely. So for starters, we obviously like to emphasize when people ask us this source, we do emphasize that it is aged, bottled, and blended here in Memphis. So we have transformed the product into our own. Uh, our climate is, of course, unique. We have a great uh, aquifer system with really unique water here for proofing and blending. Um, and then the exacting you know, bottle entry proof is going to obviously affect the taste, et cetera. I can attest to the Memphis magic aging here. Like we <laughs> put some barrels different. here a year or two and it's like, holy shit. Yeah, you we know? have the perfect climate for it here with a little bit higher humidity, a little bit higher heat. And that was one of the early due diligence boxes we needed to check was, does Memphis even make sense to do this? We're from here. We wanted to do it here, uh, et cetera. But then we emphasize the art of the blend as well of so the right selecting the right barrels that pair well together to create a complete product from beginning mid palate to finish. Uh, but then one of our things is I am laser focused on delivering the the highest quality product to the market for the best possible value. So the best value doesn't mean the cheapest possible price. When it comes to uh, consumer goods, retail price is is going to affect the consumer's uh, perception of your product and the value that they're receiving. So you don't just want to sell it for a dollar a bottle or as low as you possibly could, right? You want to find the sweet point in the market. And so to your point, a lot of folks that are uh, laying down new fill on contract or sourcing product on the bulk market are selling their finished goods for what I think are exorbitantly high prices. So we're, again, we're really focused on delivering quality relative to value. So our, our Blue Note Juke Joint, for example, is one of the better examples of that in our portfolio. It is a three to four year old Kentucky bourbon with our proprietary mash bill and oak source. And we retail that for MSRP $29.99 on the shelf. You'll see it oftentimes for as low as 26 to uh, 29.99. And that is uh, a 93 proof Kentucky bourbon. And you'd see other folks selling that for $45 a bottle. Our nine-year-old premium small batch, you know, is of course nine years age dated, 93 proof. We retail that for between 49 and 52.99. Our River Set Rise, a four-year-old Tennessee rye that we retail for 26, 27 to 29.99 a bottle. So really being focused on where the products need to be price to sell at high volumes because there's this interesting uh thing when building a brand to ryan's point earlier is you're not it's not a get rich quick scheme you have to go pretty deep into the red in order to eventually uh, achieve you know uh high profitability in the future so there's sort of a loss leader element that's not literally a loss leader but it's the sort of analogous term in, in business of where you have to compress your margin to pretty thin early to build economies of scale right, to then where you're selling enough volume to where your, your margin then increases as your component costs go down, like your bottle label costs. And then ultimately the way to get your whiskey cost down, which is the main driver, is to have a whole lot more inventory of it in economies of scale. You just keep investing and putting more and more and more and more into it until, yeah, until it actually does sort of like kind of have like a- Keep a, feeding the cow and one day you'll get to milk it. There Absolutely. you go, that's, that's a great analogy. Now, the other thing that I noticed is that, you know, you all love the number 93. How'd you get to 93 on, on all these? Yeah, so we like 93. We wanted to come up with something unique that was more of like a house proof for our main SKUs. And uh, our Blue Note brand, uh, we're here in Memphis, is named after the Memphis Blues, 
which were really pioneered in the 1920s and were becoming nationally popular. Blues music was becoming nationally popular in the 1930s. And of course, the 1930s for all of us represents a great decade because that's the repeal of prohibition in 1933. So we were debating between 92, 93, 94, which is where we really liked the products. We thought they were showing best for our ultimate goal. We chose 93 because it's got the, the century and decade, the nine and the three for the 1930s, which corresponds to the blues and, and the repeal of prohibition. We wanted to do something over 90 proof, right? We wanted to do something that was, uh, would appeal to the bourbon and whiskey aficionados, but also be palatable to those that are newer to, uh, to the bourbon and whiskey game. Um, and so we don't chill filter any of our products and in order to best show the product without flocking, it needs to be over at least 90, 92 proof. And then in order to appeal to that newer emerging group of folks that are getting into whiskey, that we, we learned pretty early on that the cast strength stuff that, that maybe we here in our team internally love, uh, isn't going to necessarily be, be the biggest, highest volume seller. So trying to find something in the sweet spot that could appeal to all drinkers. Oh, absolutely. And so, you know, more that we, we talk about just the brands, like, and also want to talk about, because you had mentioned building a team and growing a brand. And so you said you're in 10 states now, mm -hmm. what's it take? And I think this is also great for listeners, uh, want to be entrepreneurs out there. What's it take to actually have a brand take it to a new market and then grow that market? So, you know, it takes the right distribution partner. And so early on, or you, I go to a lot of craft uh, distillery or pre-COVID went to a lot of craft distillery conferences and you hear people complaining about the wholesalers or distributors, right? And just for reference, there's, it's a three-tiered system. Suppliers can only sell to wholesalers. Wholesalers can only sell to retailers, meaning we can't sell directly to a liquor store or to a consumer. So we have to rely on this middleman, the distributor. And you hear a lot of startup folks or, or craft folks really complaining about the distributor because the distributor does take a pretty hefty margin, typically around 30%. But the distributor is your best friend if you can incentivize them to push your product because they are the gatekeeper to their given market. So uh, we recognized that early on that instead of trying to thwart or circumvent the system, we needed to work the system that was in place and learn how to uh, distribute our product through the three-tiered system, which takes really understanding how it works. Uh, but which is never fun, right? I mean, there's, I mean, it's, just, there's it's, so many. There's it's so, much so crap different in every market, too. That's the thing, right? We're in ten states, and sometimes even within the same state, like in Tennessee, it's very different market to market. So it's sort of learning the game in each one of these markets and figuring out how best to uh, incentivize the distributor to push our product the hardest, uh, while also maintaining as much margin as possible. So. Um, you know, we're, we're very blessed that we have a great uh, distribution team. We're with a number of different distributors. We're pretty much a different distributor for each market. So it is complex from the organization and management standpoint. But um, what, what I don't think most people understand about like why you see a display of a certain product at a liquor store is not necessarily, I mean, you would think it's because that's the best seller or that's where the most consumer demand is. It, it oftentimes can be that's where the most uh, incentive dollars have been placed to the distributor or price decrease in states where that's allowed incentive to the retailer. So there's a, a thing called depletion allowances, DAs, as they're referred to in the industry, where you would put an incentive uh, to a liquor store to buy, say, three, five, 10 or 15 cases at a time, as opposed to just one case at a time. And that would uh, presumably give them longer margin in the product by discounting the case costs which would give them incentive to stack it, you know, high and wide. And that mean, that's probably why you're seeing, uh, if you're wondering why, why that brand that seems odd, it's probably because there's a program in place to incentivize that store to do that. Uh, and so understanding the nuances of the industry from that perspective uh, has taken three years. And, you know, we're still very much non-experts at this. We're still very, you know, green. And so when it comes to building a team, one of the other key things is hiring internally your own sales force. So the distributor takes you know, around 30% to sell the product, and, but they oftentimes are big companies, big firms that carry hundreds, if not thousands of different brands. So in order for your brand to see success, in, in addition to marketing dollars, right? Instagram ads, billboards, radio, you have to hire your own sales team to go out and meet with all the retailers, whether it be bars, liquor stores, restaurants, whomever, and, and then to work with the distributing reps to push your product. And so that's why building the right team is key. Um, not only from a sales perspective, but even into more of the back office roles. Like early on, 
we realize that there's an awful lot of math and finance and accounting <laughs> that goes into this, right? And just bullshit paperwork. <laughs> a lot of it. So um, I'm a lawyer and I can put together a rudimentary spreadsheet that would be directionally correct to the result, but oftentimes it doesn't cut it for the purposes of taxes and, and for pro forma planning. So early on, we realized we needed to hire internally our own accounting team. We were using an external accounting company and, and to help with some various finance projections as well as doing our accounting. We realized that wasn't going to work. So we had to make that early capital commitment to bring in our own uh, finance and accounting team. Um, and then spending to hire the right salespeople has proven to bring the most success. So how, where did you get that mindset from? Because a lot of entrepreneurs are like, you know, they, they they have like the, for lack of a better term, like a technician's mindset. Like I can do everything. I can, you know, yep. I'm going to handle it all. Like, But sounds like you've kind of like outsourced it all to like people that are, you know, that's their specific, you know, niche or whatever, and they can help you. Yeah. Well, I mean, not nah, this is a cheesy analogy. It's a lot of off, like like creating the perfect blend of barrels. You have to find complementary uh, complementary barrels or complementary folks to build the team. So early on, you wear as as the as a as a co founder or founder of a company or CEO, you're going to wear an awful lot of hats. But your success is going to be determined based on your ability to um, disperse responsibility and delegate tasks to others and finding folks that are better than you at certain areas. Like no one person is probably gonna be the best at everything, right? Uh, accounting finance is not my background. I'm a lawyer. I, I can see the big picture and I can, I can do the nitty gritty uh, operations as well, but finding complementary talent. So uh, Logan, our CFO was one of our first key hires. Uh, because he came with you know seven years of tax experience at KPMG, having worked with a lot of the biggest companies in our region, and he's a great guy with a passion for our industry. And that hire was really key and instrumental to our success. And and that's also a testament of early on. I built the right uh, partners with my co-founders who are seasoned business men uh, in our community that have a lot of experience, and they were adamant early on that we need to make the investment in building out a team that was you know positioned to scale and grow and so that's not just from our previous business experience it's also meeting with other folks that have been successful in this industry you know aside from you know really taking the leap of faith and laying down the inventory the other repeated theme or axiom i hear from other successful folks is you got to make the investment in the back office as well as you have to make the investment in the internal sales force even though at the time it's really hard to justify right because it's like our sales are this we're about to invest this. Um, but that's again, yeah, like one the of the chicken other leaps. the egg kind it's, of there, that's like That goes yeah. back to that leap of faith, uh, that leap of faith thing. So the one thing that I did read in an entrepreneurial book is there's only one, so there's very different types of CEOs, very different types of entrepreneurs out there in terms of personality types. The one commonality is the inherent optimism yep. quality. Oh, so you that's in order definitely take, you. If, in order to take those leaps of faith, you have to have that just inherent Every night, every morning, optimism of somehow, no matter what happens, whatever fires you're going to put out today, it's going to work out. Yeah, I thought I was like a crazy idea man. Then I met Macaulay and I was like, <laughs> man, he has got ideas for days. Like we just talk all day about them. Because you always are like, oh, you never know. Like today, that's oh, the worst day ever. This thing's going to flop. And the next day you're like, oh, everything's great again. Oh, it's the emotional roller coaster of an owner. It's like the highs are highs and the lows are lows. But one other thing, just I feel like I got off off track a little bit of. That's my fault. Finding the right distribution partners is really tough. In a, in a market where there's just an ever-growing supply of new, uh, the demand's increasing. Like there's an ever-growing supply of new brands or new SKUs from even existing companies coming on the market of finding groups that are willing to pick up your product and ones that you feel really comfortable with that have bought into your vision that are going to execute is, is one of the most daunting tasks of, of this. So, you, you know, you can be focused all day long on distillation, fermentation, uh, maturation, et cetera, and getting the quality control but really uh, the rubber meets the road when it comes to sales. Yeah. And you know, that's your revenue drive. That's your offense. And finding those right partners is really difficult um, because it's just such a competitive landscape. And so you can't just say, well, hey, we're going to open up California, Texas, Florida, New York, all the biggest states next year because just because you want to wa want them doesn't mean they necessarily want you. So there's a lengthy process of reaching out and finding. And that's, again, where this industry is so connection driven because if you have the right you know, in with a distributor to, to get that phone call or now these days the Zoom call set up for you. It, it just changes everything versus trying to cold call or send, you know, wild emails to people. Yeah. yeah. I, go ahead, Ryan. Oh, I was going to say like, 
Dave Picker always talked about, you know, with craft guys like owning in your own yard. And Tennessee is obviously a big bourbon, uh, you know, state. Uh, talk about how competitive it's been to like get established here, and then like maybe where you found kind of, or maybe you don't want to share your secrets. Uh, <laughs> you know, states where you've seen some success that you necessarily didn't think you would. Yeah, so that's a um, in our board meetings and general strategy meetings. That's a that this concept of expanding broad versus deep driving distribution in our home market is a constant topic, because in order to be successful, you have to have really deep distribution in your home, in your home market. Meaning, you got to own your backyard, and, and owning your backyard is sort of an amorphous term that would, different people would define different ways. Like, what is success type thing? It's a difficult thing to define. Um, but you also have to be constantly increasing sales because I mean, in any business, the key is cash flow. So there's this constant juggling act of expanding outward while also driving distribution deeper in your core focus market. So you ultimately have to tier your priorities and say, look, we just launched in Colorado, for example, and we're seeing great success out there, which is a testament, uh, hopefully not only to our brands, but also it's a huge testament to our distribution partner out there, but they know that we're not gonna be able to get out to Colorado and, and hire someone yet. It's gonna be sort of a sell-in phase. So there's gonna be relatively thin distribution. Don't expect to see us on a ton of bar, back bars or menu features yet, focusing on the off-premise first, getting the sales in. But our focus markets right now are in our backyard here in Tennessee and, and mostly the Memphis and Nashville markets. So that's where we're investing really heavily in trying to get you know, menu placements, uh, back bar features, et cetera, as well as large case stacks in our retailers. And then next year, we'll add another focus market and keep juggling uh, because nobody wants really thin distribution very broadly, right? You want to have a footing and a foothold in, in markets. So it's a tiered approach. So next year, we'll add another one to our, that focus and so forth and so so on as we expand out. But I mean, it's it's a lot to wrap your head around when you're thinking about all the operational sides plus building the brand side of it. Um, but, but it's obviously really fun. Yeah. yeah. What's the like better, uh, return on investment, like going and getting your product placed in like bars and restaurants or like really focusing on like package stores, you know, like where, where have you seen like the biggest bang for your buck? Yep. So with a startup brand, you're going to see around 80 to maybe even as much as 90% of your sales occurring off premise at the liquor stores. Um, with the with the balance, of course, being on premise at the bars and restaurants, but then there's also a competing thought of that uh, on premise at the bars and restaurants is where you really build your brand because that's where your brand gatekeepers, your bartenders, servers, bar managers, etc., can turn someone onto your product by uh, introducing them to, it. hey, you ordered a, a your old fashioned with Jack Daniels, what if you try this local craft instead? It's only a dollar more or whatever. And that's how that person has that drink at the bar, which is low risk, right? To try something new, one drink versus buying a whole bottle. Then presumably if they like it, hopefully they'll go buy it uh, off premise. But um, deep distribution uh, and having really deep sales in any given market takes uh, a combination of your on and off premise markets really, really working well. But it's just such a competitive industry. And so here in Memphis, Crown Royal is really big. Our distributor distributes Crown Royal, West Tennessee Crown. Um, and so Crown Royal is not a bourbon, obviously, but um, to to a lot of, you know, novice or, or drinkers that don't, that are shopping value and that don't really care about the exact specifics, um, they will might lean Crown over Jack um, because they, they find them to be very similar products. But to give you an idea is in, in my research, so nobody out there, um, hold me to this, but uh, High West and Angels Envy, when they, when they sold to the bigger conglomerates, were selling around 50 to 60,000 nine liter cases nationally. Crown Royal in Memphis alone sells 50,000 to 60,000 nine liter cases just wow. in Memphis. And so there's obviously the Jacks, the Gems and other massive brands too. But when you're thinking about really trying to own your backyard and get deep distribution, you know, wow, you're competing against the complete juggernaut um, yeah. that just has that damn purple bag. I was about to say you should put some some purple bags on your on your bottles here, and you get to <laughs> compete with them. You know, and I think that's also, um, you know, we're kind of running low on time here. There's, sure, sure. There's a few different things I want to want to touch on because we've we hit a, there's a lot of frustrating things that mm -hmm. go into the source market. I mean, we've we've hit a lot of them. I know we have our own problems with distribution, like being in Texas, like 
every month I have to file a report, even if we didn't sell one or like <laughs> ship any bottle, I have still have to file a report with the state of Texas. So it's, it's really, really frustrating. But one thing we didn't hit on um, is another part of the supply chain, and that's just material costs. Um, not no whiskey alone, but I mean, you're talking glass, tops, labels, seals, all that sort of stuff. Have you found that, is there a part that's that's been frustrating in that process as well? Absolutely. And um, so that's, we refer to that as the dry goods. So you have your wet goods of your, your finished goods. Your dry goods would include your glass, labels, stopper, seals, boxes, et cetera. Um, obviously, COVID has had an impact because a lot of glass is coming from either Brazil, Mexico, or China. So there's some supply chain issues just due to transportation, et cetera, there. But um, glass is typically sold by the pallet if you're buying in small quantities, but really when you get into it, you start buying by the container load, you know, a shipping container full. And uh, the difference in price per bottle from buying 10 pallets versus buying a full container load, which would be about 45 pallets, might only be five cents savings per bottle. And you're sitting there kind of scratching your head. It's like, man, that's not really worth tying up that amount of capital in glass. But then you start looking at the transportation cost because one thing a lot of entrepreneurs forget is to bake in the overall true cost of something which of course includes transportation once you start factoring the cost to move a full container is only there's no amazon prime, no, <laughs> no amazon prime. <laughs> isn't that much more than just moving the 10 pallets so yeah. there's an awful lot that goes to sourcing that as well and tying up both space and capital and your dry goods because you want to have you know the whole the name of the game is increasing margin when you sell the finished goods and you know it's it's a penny business when you boil it down that five cent savings on the glass can uh, it adds up. It adds up pretty thousands. quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, guys, we kind of start wrapping it up here. Uh, is there anything else that's frustrating in the sourcing and building a brand that we haven't touched on yet? I think we hit a, a lot of good angles here. Yeah. I mean, I think the overall thing that's the most frustrating is the biggest picture element, which is the fact that people turn their nose up at sourced products or blended products. Um, I think if we look overseas to our cousins in the scotch industry, where you see the master blender really being heralded as uh, the celebrity type status that controls the brand and the quality of it. And you see it in cognac as well. I, I, I mentioned those to, to emphasize the art form that comes into creating a product. As you guys have played around with and experienced, you can take the same base uh, whiskey and take it in an awful lot of different directions based on how you blend the water source uh, and then the actual bottle entry proof. Um, so I guess my overall frustration is that people don't respect enough the quality that is out there in a lot of the sourced brands. You know, our, we, we really do think blending and the whole back office side of it and the operation side is an art form. And we, we do think we are delivering some of the best quality products relative to price on the market today. So, you know, give us and other groups like us uh, a chance because, you know, we're entrepreneurs that are trying to make make a living and trying to build something and oftentimes there's a couple early steps that it takes, i.e. sourcing before you start distilling in order to build that brand to the overall uh, goal. And even yeah. sourcing, uh, you got to understand that with nine-year products, it usually tastes a lot better than some of those two-year craft products that you're going to be getting on the market. So <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, you, 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 no have a, you have a very, uh, it's, a, it's a very low risk sometimes when you when you look at it that too so but mccall i want to say thank you again for coming on the show today uh a thank you for coming on the show and b helping us along yeah. the way too because you've been instrumental in the success of you know pursuit spirits and you know we're always a big fan and cheerleader of everything you guys are doing with here at blue note and river set and everything like that yeah too. i really appreciate you having me on can't wait to see the success of what we can build with the pursuit spirits brands uh, as well as our own and if you want to learn more about us you can check us out at uh, at Blue Note Bourbon or at Riverset Rye on Instagram or Facebook, uh, bluenotebourbon.com, riversetrye.com, and then our, our parent company is brdistilling.com. So if you're out there wanting to to learn more, I'm always open to meeting folks in the industry. So. Yeah, you, you stole it out of my mouth and you have to say like, yeah. oh, where can people find you? There we go. He, it's like he's, he's, he's a pro. Trained. He's done this before. Yeah, so. you got somebody on that board giving him PR <laughs> stuff. Hey, I've done a couple of like radio interviews. So oh, okay. but this is my first podcast. This is exciting. There we go. Yeah, Break it, life make changing. It <laughs> <laughs> so make sure you follow them on all the socials. Follow us as well, Bourbon Pursuit, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, everywhere that you can find out cool information about us. And then if you like the show and want to support the show, leave us a comment, a review, anywhere you actually watch us or listen to it. And you can also support us, patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit. So, yeah. Yeah. Ryan, let's you want to close this out, man? Let's go pick some barrels. Cheers. That sounds great. All right. Cheers, everybody. We'll see you all next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks.